Kozar. Welcome to the Star Tribune. Thanks, Jeremy. Nice to be here. So tell us a little bit about who you are and what you're running. Well, I think that uh, you, when you come from Western Wyoming and the son of an oil field worker, um, you see Wyoming a little bit differently um, than, uh, than many folks do. Um, I'm very familiar with the boom and bust of our economy, and I worry about economic diversity. It has a real impact. It has in my life. Uh, you know, many folks, uh, or a few folks, maybe followed uh, my career at the University of Wyoming where I was a walk-on, and you learn very many lessons at, uh, as a walk-on. You learn about... Uh, the power of a, of a vision and a dream. Uh, you, you learn about the effort and the consistency that's required. And, and then you also learn about how you need a person along the way or a few people along the way to help you out. And for me, that's very uh, apropos to running for governor. Um, we have some great opportunities in Wyoming. Um, we've done some really nice stuff uh, uh, by allowing us to have some money that uh, is a, a way that we can use. Um, but right now, we're not investing in our people and our places. Um, we need to, to find a way to dream bigger in Wyoming, in healthcare, in education, in the economy, um, and use some of those resources and funds that are available to invest in our people. I think as a business um, or as an organization um, that you have to reinvest, that you have to take that money and put it back uh, because no organization that's around for the long haul uh, doesn't reinvest in its people and places. And, and when I see the cuts to to game and fish. Uh, I see the, the reduction in, in science standards. Uh, I'm really concerned about um, Wyoming's future, and I think you lay the groundwork for Wyoming's future today. A and I think we have uh, not done so well in the last four years doing that. So first, first thing, let's say you're elected governor. What's the first policy decision that you'd make? Well, the first policy decision you make when you're elected um, is to remove SF-104. I think you have to remove the, the divisiveness uh, that came with that discussion. Um, you know, if, as I've traveled around the state, um, right, left, center, um, however a person comes down ideologically, um, that that has been uh, something that has bothered them since it was passed. Uh, I think you start with a clean slate. You say, let's remove that, um, take care of, of all that, um, and let's move forward. You know, certainly, we can do better in education. Certainly, we can do better in some of these things. but. Uh, you know, with that still on the books, I think you still have a burr under a saddle, as it were, and you need to get rid of that. So, says if you would, how Wyoming has achieved its goals relating to the Endangered Species Act, specifically regarding wolves and sage grouse? Well, I think that when you take the future in your own hands, um, which uh, Wyoming has done with sage grouse, uh, you have an, a way to impact, uh, a way to have a future that you uh, come down on, that you have a, a, a role in. Um, I'm a little disconcerted about the wolf issue. Um, I think if, if people look uh, at the judge's ruling uh, that came down just recently, the judge didn't have much a, of a, a personal uh, attack on, the, on our wolf plan. But what she did say, it was non-binding, and that the very essence of our plan uh, needed to be binding. And we had years to work on it. And I think that that's um, a classic example of mismanagement. Um, we had years to make that uh, binding. And, you know, if you look around the states, Montana and Idaho, they're hunting wolves and their wolf plans are in effect. And the people of Wyoming have to ask, why wasn't ours made binding? Um, why did we not dot the I's and cross the T's? Um, and I think that's an important distinction between those two. Um, one, we were proactive and, and took uh, control of the situation and, and came up with a plan and, and we dotted the I's and crossed the T's. The other, um, I'm not sure why we didn't do it, um, but it's put us in a tough spot right now. So this kind of goes right into this next question. How would you assess the state of Wyoming's relationship to the federal government, and, and how would it change under a GOSAR administration? Well, I, you know, having not been in the room, uh, it's hard to assess other than just watching and reading. Uh, I think that uh, there are times when you need to push back against the, the federal government. Um, but you should also, you should also start um, not at the lit litigation stage. You should start um, with an understanding and say, you know, these are the places that we need to work with uh, the federal government, and, and these are the places where we can't work. Uh, and then you, you move forward. I think if you look around the states, and, and you have to measure yourself uh, am amongst uh, the Mountain West states, you see in, in an article just uh, a few days ago in your uh, magazine, uh, the difference in the number of suits. Um, I think Wyoming's over 30. Uh, everybody around us, uh, nearly five, four or five. And, you know, there needs to be accountability in the governor's office when it comes to these lawsuits. 
what are we getting and what are we spending and what do we hope to get? I think that if you don't have that clear, if you don't have that delineated to the people of Wyoming, then they, they wonder um, about every time you hear about uh, federal overreach. I think it's not well understood that on some of those cases, we're on the same side as a federal department. Um, and then there's another case where we're in uh, an appeals process in the state of Idaho that Idaho has dropped out. Um, those are concerning to me. Um, and we have to ask through those questions and those questions have to be answered. What, uh, what will you do to ensure the viability of, of Wyoming coal? Well, I think it goes back to, to how you ensure the viability of anything. Um, you take the future and, and you work with it and you craft it and you put it under your control. And so we have to innovate and we have to adapt. Um, to say and, and to scream the war on coal and that being your only solution is, is not um, a, a viable solution to me. Um, so you use what you can do uh, at the university, at your community colleges, it's your experts at your power plants and your coal uh, companies. Um, and then there's plenty of retired people in Wyoming that would like to help. Uh, I, th I think back on, on oil drilling, um, and my dad was involved in the oil business for a long, long time. The uh, technolog technology that's advanced today is much different, and it would have been hard, hard to imagine um, when he left the field 20-some years ago. And I think that we can apply that same type of can-do attitude to coal, and I think we have to. Um, you remove the emissions, you don't have to worry about the EPA. Uh, that's the solution. Uh, we know that's the solution. Um, we're not going to sue our way to success. Um, we have to find a solution, and I'm very focused on solutions. So how do you assess the relationship between the governor's office and the legislature for where it is now, and how would it change under your administration? Well, I think uh, in my administration that uh, the framers and, and the people who wrote our Constitution uh, understood the the separation of powers. And, and I think that right now um, that's not well understood between the governor's office and the legislature. Um, I think that uh, there have been times uh, when the legislature has overreached um, and have micromanaged in many places that, that, hasn't, ha that hasn't been helpful. Uh, that's where the governor's office needs to step in, either before or, or during or after the fact, and say this is just not something that, that needs to continue. Um, you know, we're all here to do a job. Uh, we have all our constitutional roles and responsibilities. Um, but, you know, I'll take care of the executive branch um, and you take care of making the laws. And, and I think um, those lines have been blurred. And for me, um, I would try to unblur those lines. Can you tell us an example of where, that, where, that, where those lines have gotten blurred? Well, I think you, when you come right down to education policy at a budget footnote, um, a science standards, um, you know, that was done by the State Board of Education, which serves at the pleasure of the governor. Um, I believe it's something as important as science uh, instruction in, in Wyoming schools uh, should have been, um, if it was going to be a policy matter, should have been debated on the floor with an open uh, process in both houses with citizens the right to respond, um, not in a last minute deal attached to a footnote. Um, and so I think that that's an example of an overreach. I think the governor had the ability to line out and veto on that appropriations bill that came before him. He chose not to. Um, for me, that one's an easy one. I would have chose uh, and I would have lined out and vetoed uh, that, uh, that science censor. Um, that's an overstep. And, and I think it's not something that's terribly helpful to, to people in Wyoming today or the future of Wyoming. Talk to me about the, the idea of a good old boy network of, of haves and haves nots. Uh, it's certainly come up in this election. Uh, Republican primary in that sense. Uh, do you buy the idea of, of the good old boys? And if so, would you consider yourself one of them? Well, it was interesting when I was uh, uh, accused of being a good old boy. Uh, I've never really seen a, a chauffeur uh, being accu accused of being a good old boy. And I think, uh, you know, Mr. Wills didn't realize that I had worked at the state uh, six years before uh, Governor Meade took office. And so I think that uh, to be accused of being a good old boy uh, is really kind of interesting. Um, however, I do think that there's some merit to that. Um, you look at what's happened at the University of Wyoming. Um, prime example is, is the trustees. Um, there's a statute on the books right now that says only seven can be from, a, from one party. Um, your paper and other papers alerted the, the governor's office to the fact that they were not in compliance. And the response was that that rule is impractical. Um, and we'll comply as, as openings come available. 
Well, that's not how it works in the real world. Um, I can only imagine uh, a drunk driver trying to tell a, a arresting police officer um, that's impractical for me to comply with that law. And if you just wait a few hours, I won't be drunk anymore, and then we won't have um, an infraction. And so, um, you know, there is a couple of set of rules, um, and I think people are tired of it. I, I, you know, when you remove art from a Wyoming campus, when you stop free speech, um, it, it is, tears the fabric of not only your university, but as your society. You have to apply laws to everybody, and as a governor, you have the obligation to be the upholder of the law. You are the model that we all uh, ascribe uh, to be, and you have to hold yourself to higher account. Um, mistakes can happen. Um, you can make mistakes. Um, but the thing that you remedy it is you say, I'm sorry, made a mistake, and tomorrow we'll find, we'll have this done by tomorrow. We'll have, we'll be in compliance at the UW trustees. It's a law, it was important, um, and you have to follow it. Speaking of upholding laws, uh, regarding, uh, regarding the Supreme Court's decision last week regarding uh, gay marriage, what, should, what, what would you have done as governor uh, in the wake of that decision, considering you know, where, where Wyoming's law is and then also uh, the status of that 10th Circuit appeal? In that discussion and, and in, in, the, in the governor's office in general, you have to make the best read you can uh, of the future and where the law is headed. Um, I think you saw uh, Governor Scott Walker in Wisconsin and some other Republican governors say, you know, uh, we might disagree, uh, but the writing's on the wall for us, and, and we're going to remove ourselves from the field. We don't no longer need to waste state time, state resources. Uh, I think you'll see in the coming weeks and months uh, that the governor will be in that same position, um, except that we've wasted time. You know, uh, I'm not a lawyer, um, but I think that it's pretty clear. If you look at the, the records um, from June of 2013, we've had 41 decisions in federal, state, and federal appeal courts uh, upholding the Tenth Circuit's uh, take on it. The Supreme Court of the United States upheld the Tenth Circuit. Um, we have a, a case on Thursday, uh, tomorrow, um, that's going to be ruled in, in federal court here in Wyoming. And, and I think, you know, it, it's not long before we're going to have to find a way forward, um, whether we agree or disagree. It's your role as a governor is to look into the future, work with your attorney general and say, are we expending resources uh, that we could be putting towards free and reduced lunch, that we could be towards health care? Um, and does this make sense? Is this something I can justify to the voters of Wyoming, um, not only on uh, constitutional grounds, but on expenditure grounds? And I think right now the, the governor I can't justify his decision. So what would you have done in the interim then between then and, and the possible decision or at least the consideration of the decision tomorrow? You know, I would ask my attorney general um, uh, what would the path was forward and if it was legal for, for clerks uh, and county clerks uh, to be able to issue and be in compliance with the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals ruling. Um, you know, I'm not uh, a lawyer, uh, and I certainly would, would uh, ask for their uh, uh, guidance. Um, but I think that you have to um, know where the world's going and get there as fast as you can. Um, whether you agree with the decision or not, um, that's not for you to decide as the governor. You're there to comply with the law. Let's talk about the, the developmentally disabled. What would you do differently as governor uh, from uh, Governor Meade regarding the placement of developmentally disabled on the waiting list for uh, waivers to receive services and why? This is a critical issue, and this is maybe um, the single largest issue uh, that I've been talked with um, at gas stations, uh, at street corners, um, as I went to a person's porch. Um, there are people um, that feel like they've been abandoned um, by what's happened with the developmentally disabled, um, that the 7 percent budget cuts that were extended to them, their families, um, to community providers, has left us in a really tough spot. Um, many uh, providers have left and gone and, and found a different uh, career path. And it's left small town families um, without options. Um, and you can see it in their eyes. Um, and I think that there's, this is one that's crying out for a solution. Um, I've heard some interesting ideas about setting up a trust fund with, with the dividends of that trust fund being used uh, to help uh, fund the development of the disabled. I think that there's merit to that. Um, 
I think that you have to look for a solution. Um, certainly, uh, I think that there's a, a need for a tiered uh, approach in Wyoming uh, with a family, a community, and, and then if we need uh, a regional-based uh, 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 care facility, um, then you need to do that. Um, and I think you need to fund that. Uh, you know, you, you're putting people in a really tough spot um, between choosing to work uh, and you're putting families in really difficult positions. You know, it's not, um, it's well known in the industry that, that care providers die often before the person they provide care. I um, mean, if you look in these people's faces uh, with the lack of sleep, uh, the tear at their family uh, fabric, uh, this is something that needs to be solved and needs to be solved right away. Uh, we can no longer uh, choose to put this off. Uh, we had a Weston decision in the 90s uh, with so Governor Sullivan, um, and we need to be in compliance with that. We need to, at one point after that, we were number one in the care of the disabled, um, and we, sh we have slipped to the number 41, and we need to return to that. Question. Are you comfortable with the size of Wyoming state government? And as governor, would you, uh, what would you change regarding uh, departments or duties? I'm comfortable with the size. Uh, I, I think that there's always a need to uh, um, make a look at, at government, take a look at government and make it uh, efficient and as effective as it can be. Uh, I think there's opportunities in, in really different uh, ways. Uh, I think you can ask people inside um, government itself, say, how, how would you help your department? Is there some other department that you have an idea with um, that might save money or make it more efficient? Uh, I worked at uh, the aeronautics department before I became the operations manager. Uh, when I took over as operations manager, we went to a paperless uh, reservation format. Uh, we went to an efficient uh, flight profile, um, and that saved thousands and hundreds of thousands of dollars every year. Um, you know, it's often said that, you know, um, government entities will just use up the money because it's zero-based accounting. Well, that's not true. I think if you look at the aeronautics department, uh, we returned hundreds of thousands of dollars in fuel. Uh, because people in Wyoming uh, and the, the workers in Wyoming want that government to operate as efficiently as they can. And, and you, can, uh, you can ask that from people. Um, you can ask from people within government and outside government. How would you streamline the process? How would you make it uh, more efficient and more effective? Uh, after all, I think that's how you look at government, not smaller or larger. I think it should be measured on, on efficiency and effectiveness. I want to ask a question about Game and Fish, too, because yeah. so often the conversation about the future of Game and Fish revolves around you know, ideally what you'd like to see or something like that. What I'd, what I'd be curious to know is what you think is actually possible. Like what would you propose as governor as a budget solution for Game and Fish that you think would actually fly with the legislature? Well, I think you, we have uh, much to lose at the Game and Fish without funding it. Um, you know, I just read uh, a feed this morning that uh, CWD's uh, now in a, in a hunt area in Lander. Um, you know, as a guy who grew up in western Wyoming, uh, that seems to be a bit... Uh, faster uh, to the west than we thought. Uh, so you have to worry about habitat, you have to worry about access, you have to worry about research and hunter programs. And so the question you're asking that I, that I hear from you, Jeremy, is how do you fund it? Um, well, it's been tr traditionally funded on the backs of, of uh, hunting and fishing licenses. Um, I think that that no longer can be the sole funding mechanism. Uh, I think you need uh, to remove the benefit packages of, of the Game and Fish employees and put them on the general fund with the rest of the state agencies. I, I think that that makes sense. Um, I think that hunter and fishing licenses should go to access and habitat. I think that you can draw a straight line and people were, would be on board with that. And then I think there's an opportunity, you know, we swept in hundreds of millions of dollars um, and, and maybe there's a place uh, to where you set up an account that says, you know, um, the game fish is too important to have to go every two years to ask for budget um, uh, allocations. Uh, how do you do that? Um, you know, I, I guess you'll, it'll, at the point of uh, uh, sounding uh, redundant, um, maybe you have a trust fund that's set up for that. Um, those are important uh, things to do. Um, we have $18 billion in certain accounts throughout Wyoming. Um, and so there's money to be to be used and there's money to be spent. We have uh, hundreds of cans, it seems, uh, uh, that we don't even know exactly what's in them. Um, I think that people in Wyoming would be on board um, to have an account that, that was dedicated to game and fish. And uh, 
Uh, I think that solves a, a lot of the problems with not having to raise hunting licenses, using the money that's generated as your state for a very important industry, and, and making sure that research and habitat and access is not on a two-year plan, but a 5, 10, 15, 20-year plan, which is more important. Any questions? Well, thank you so much, and I'll give you a couple minutes to, to make a closing statement. Well, thank you. I, it's, been, it's always been a pleasure. Um, for me, as a, a kid who grew up in Pinedale um, and now lives in Laramie, uh, I think that you you use those things that are available to you, those tools that are accessible to you. Um, for me, politics in Wyoming is about a straightforward approach. It's about dealing with people and honestly telling them what you think. Um, my answers today and my answers throughout the campaign have been as honest as I could make them. Um, uh, and I think that that is the key. Um, I know that... Uh, there are many more Republicans than Democrats in this state. Um, but I've been on their porches, and I've met them at their places. Um, this last debate in Newcastle um, that happened just this week was the first time a gubernatorial debate had ever been there. Um, and I'm not sure it was attended um, uh, by as many Democrats as there were Republicans. Uh, but to a person, um, the people asked and, and thanked uh, for that access. Um, I think access. Um, uh, an honest approach and a willingness to work it, it are those things that I offer. Uh, uh, I'm pretty sure I don't have all the answers. Um, but I do know uh, that I, I know a lot of really good people who are willing to engage if that's the key, if they're willing to be heard, um, if they're willing to be listened to and, and their ideas uh, used. Uh, I watched uh, Steve Jobs on, on a TED Talk uh, talk about what kept Apple so successful. Uh, he said, you know, we have the best people in the room, and the best ideas win. And they said, it's yours, Mr. Jobs, because you're CEO. He said, no, because if it's always my idea, then I don't have the best people in the room. And, uh, and I think that that needs to be applied to state government. Uh, we need to be in the business of solutions. Uh, we need to help people move forward. Um, getting tired of political talking points that lead to nothing. Um, I would like to talk about solutions and engage with people. And I think my campaign has been as straightforward and honest as we could with those, those three ideas. Mr. Gosar, thank you so much for coming in and sitting down with us. Thank you, Jeremy. I appreciate it.